This is the Grow Your Clinic podcast from Clinic Mastery. We help progressive health professionals to lead inspired teams, transform client experiences, and build clinics for good. Now, it's time to grow your clinic. Welcome back to another episode of the Grow Your Clinic podcast. My name is Jack O'Brien, your host, and I hope you're doing super well today, wherever you might be listening to this. I know we have people listening on the commute, while they exercise, perhaps while they're doing housework, whatever it might be for you, thank you so much. And we don't take it for granted that you trust us with your time and attention. As always, you can grab the show notes over at clinicmastery.com forward slash podcast. And let me tell you, you probably want to do that for today. Today, we are kicking off another Clinic Owner Spotlight series. I have joining me Anthony Robinson from Complete Podiatry. Anthony, welcome here today. How are you? I'm very well, thanks, Jack. Thanks for having me on today. It is absolutely my pleasure. Uh, I can't wait to dive into your story and uh, your journey. There's going to be a lot of practical tips, but also a lot of inspiration. And uh, I'm sure the the average clinic owner will get a lot out of today. But before we dive into your story, as usual, a couple of icebreaker questions. Are you ready? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. All right. Number one, what are you reading or learning right now? Oh, lots of books, unfortunately. Um, I love Audible. And um, so I've got my favorite at the moment I'm going through is Make Time by Jake Knapp and John Zaratsky, and also The Coaching Habit by Michael Stanier. And on the bedside table, we've got Endure by Alex Hutchinson, which is about endurance athletes and the ability of the body to push itself beyond boundaries. And The Resilience Project by Hugh Van Kylenberg, which is very appropriate given COVID at this point in time, I reckon. That is a good spread, mate. Mm. <laughs> I know Shane Davis is a big proponent of Hugh and the Resilience yeah. Project, so uh, yeah. that's awesome. Yeah. I'm very inspired. That What was that first one you mentioned? Make Time. Okay. By, uh, yeah, Jake Knapp and John Zaratsky. It's really about focusing down on how technology is sucking time away from us. So looking at our smartphones and how we can change the way we use those to create more time. Yeah, just getting rid of what they call infinity wells, those little apps and programs which suck you into this mm. infinity pool that draws you away from all the important stuff. So my my iPhone now looks very different to before I started that. My home screen is blank uh -huh. and I actually have to go searching for apps that I want to spend time on now rather than just going, oh, it's there, I'll start it. So yeah, that, that's helped me get a little bit more time back and drastically reduce my screen time, which has been good. That's awesome. I'll have to check that one out. Thank you mm. for the recommendation. Number two, who inspires you? That's a funny one. I was, I was thinking about this one and what I think it comes down to is it, it's not a person that inspires me, one person. It's more about the qualities that people have. So people that, you know, qualities of that equity, intent and respect, which are my personal core values. So people that share those values, I guess, people that inspire me but it's not so much people. It's, it's how a person acts and, you know, we can all take things from people. Mm -hmm. And so looking at the way a person acts and, you know, the way they interact with the world, I think is more inspirational for me. And let's face it, we can become inspired, but it's what we do with that inspiration that really, really matters. Right. That's awesome. I haven't, I haven't heard anyone pitch it like that. So that's, yeah. That's really yeah, so, Thank you. I mean, you could always say, oh, this person's great, that person's great, but what it is about them and mm. it's digging a little bit deeper, I guess, that for me is more important. Mm. Mm. Love it. Uh, what did you want to be growing up, mate? Hell, Jack, I'm 46 and I still don't know what I want to be when I grow <laughs> up. <laughs> An astronaut? Or a, <laughs> uh, no, I, I distinctly remember a conversation with my mum. I must have been about seven or eight and I said, I wanted to be a police officer. And she said, why do you want to do that? And I said, well, I want to help people. And I, I guess I've carried that on and all health professionals want to help people, but I just want to be something that can do good and to actually make a difference in people's lives more than anything else. So whether that's podiatry or something else down the track, who knows? Love it. What's a motto that you live by? My motto in life is just be nice to people, guys. You know, there are so many crap things in life going on these days and it doesn't take much to be nice but hey be nice it goes a long way right it does it does mm. all right so connect the dots for us from the the young whippersnapper that wanted to be an astronaut slash police officer to yep. now a podiatry clinic owner dad what led us from that young tyke through to studying at uni podiatry well not getting into physiotherapy would be the one uh <laughs> 
thinking, oh, I didn't know what to do. So if someone said physio is good, and I didn't get into that. And then someone said, do podiatry. It's like physio for feet. It doesn't matter. You can change out after a year anyway. But I got into it and I love the immediate effect, the fact that you could put your hands on somebody, somebody that was in pain, and they can walk out half an hour later and they felt on top of the world. And so that just grabbed me straight away and never looked back from there. After graduating, I was lucky enough to get into a um, public hospital here in South Australia, Flinders Medical Centre, which is mainly a high-risk wound care centre, right. and ended up doing a lot of teaching, lecturing, educating around there, which sort of developed a bit of a love for teaching and educating for me. Mm-hmm. But after about seven or eight years, that led to quite a burnout, I reckon. I just put too much of myself into that. So I did what any Aussie did at that point in time was to quit work and move to London, where I spent two years faffing around doing all of the things I probably shouldn't be doing. But hey, you got to do it once. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. But, you know, I was lucky. I, I met my wife in London and we moved back to Adelaide. And then I started working for another clinic owner here. And that's kind of where I fell in love with private podiatry more than anything else, being able to see lots of people and help lots of people and lots of different conditions. Mm -hmm. And then I reckon it must have been 2011, I had that entrepreneurial seizure, uh, as it's put, (laughs) Yes. where you think, hell, I can do this. Right, how hard can it be? (laughs) Yeah, yeah. (laughs) I'm a great podiatrist. It'll be fine. (laughs) So fortunately, with my wife's backing, we started our little practice and um, yeah, it's been moving ever since there. And, you know, we started off with two sessions a week in a little GP practice up here in the Adelaide Hills in Stirling. And it was interesting. It got tough for a while there, but I had help along the way. And then, you know, I grew my practice to another GP practice. Then we made the, the bold move to start my own little practice and then start to employ people. And then we got a second practice that we opened up for ourselves as well. And now we've got about, what have we got? Four podiatrists, including me and, and two admin staff or two admin team members. And they're amazing. Every day I get clients telling me how lucky I am to be working with this bunch of people. It's great. That's unreal. Yeah. It sounds so easy. Oh, it does, doesn't it? It's one thing after back, another. <laughs> oh, looking back, it's like, oh, yes, this is perfectly simple. Right. Um, but there are a lot of struggles, as you know, Jack, being a clinic owner. It, it's nothing's easy. You've got mm. to give things away to, to make time for other things. Right. So you went to London, come back. What mm. was it that attracted you to private practice at that time? A full-time paying job. <laughs> uh, when I first got back, I, I got back into the public health system. And I just suddenly realized, oh, my God, the politics of this, you know, not having any control, not being able to choose how you worked or how you operated and having to battle all the time to do the right thing. It just seemed wrong. Sure. So I I thought, well, we'll we'll get into private. It'll be something a little bit different. And, yeah, just it was easier. It was easier mentally because, you know, if you wanted to work hard, you could. And you got rewarded for working harder and you could see more clients and there there wasn't as much red tape to cut through. But working in somebody else's practice, you were always restricted by what they wanted their practice to be and how Mm -hmm. they wanted clients treated. And, you know, when you start seeing clients every 20 minutes from 8 o'clock till 7 o'clock at night, you're thinking, God, there's got to be a better way to do this. And I didn't think that it was the right way to treat clients and it's not the way I wanted to be treated if I were going to see a podiatrist so that's when I started thinking there had to be a better way and yeah I started to look for it. Mm -hmm. The barriers to starting your own practice inside a medical center it's really simple looking back now what did you do well that meant that it succeeded because I know so many health professionals that do start at their own little side gigs they own their own job it's not really business they own their job and it doesn't work. What did yep. you do well that in that ensured that it worked? Focused on clients. I think that that's the big key. I didn't really start my practice to make money. I really started my practice to give people what I thought was the best care that they could get right. and to provide you know, a, a health service that was what I wanted it to be, which is something that takes care of people, gives people the best advice, is focused on their outcomes rather than what I think they want to get. Yeah. So just, just making sure that you do the right thing by clients and yeah, just give them what they, what they want and, and focus on their goals more than anything else. I love it. And it's hard to do, right? And the realities of the complexities mm. of 
commercialism yep. and, and trying to make yep. sure we had keep the bills paid. Tell me yep. then, how did you juggle that tension of really caring about the patients and their experiences versus the the skills of running a business that it's all well and good to have an entrepreneurial seizure, but yep. if you don't run a business, you'll run out of a job. How did you juggle yep. that tension? Well, I had no entrepreneurial skills. <laughs> to, truth be told, I right. didn't know how to run a business. I'm good at what I do as a podiatrist. I was a rubbish business owner. And I guess it, it, it came down one day to that, that moment where you suddenly think, oh my God, I've got to do something or this isn't going to work. Sink or swim. And I, sink or swim. Yeah, yeah. And I remember the moment I was playing a game of solitaire sitting in my clinic room as I was wont to do between clients <laughs> thinking, what am I doing? I'm sitting here waiting for people to come to me. I know I'm a good podiatrist, right. but I'm just sitting here waiting for people and how the hell are they going to find me and, and how am I going to grow this business so that I can take care of my family? And that was the moment. Yeah. And I lost that game, by the way. It just didn't work out. <laughs> You've got to go from three card down to one card. It's heaps yep. easy. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the way you phrase that really does for me sum up how you approach it because you know, we've worked together for a number of years directly yep. and indirectly and mm-hmm. you've always embraced things that maybe don't come naturally to you. You jumped on the mm-hmm. camera and social media, you know, yep. back years yep. ago in the earlier days. And how did you juggle that? Because you're, you're such a good podiatrist and loved the clinical side of things and now transitioning away from your first love, mm-hmm. say that, at least mm-hmm. professionally. Yep. How have you, have you navigated that? I love to educate people. We were talking before the podcast about that lovely moment about when you've learned a skill and it was really hard for you, but you can teach that skill to someone else and they say to you, oh, that was just easy. What's the big deal? Right. And for me, that flows through into everything I do. It's like with my work, learning skills has been really important. And then to said to myself, well, I've got to learn something new to be able to make this work. But I was in that state where I didn't know what I had to learn. Um, right. And so I had to find help basically and, and I had to grow. And I think growth is one of those things that can be difficult for everybody. Sure. Uh, I'm watching my kids grow up at the moment and that's not easy for them. And if we want to change, then we have to make an intent to change. And, you know, that's one of my personal values, that intent. So living life with a specific intent, why am I doing what I'm doing? You know, mm. and for me, that's really important thing. I, I want to be able to get up in the morning and think I'm doing this because of a reason. And my reason's always been my family mm-hmm. to be able to provide for my family and to give them a life where they don't have to struggle like so many other people out there. And I guess I'm just lucky. Well, you know, the harder you work, the luckier you get. Right. But one of those journeys that's been quite interesting looking back, but it's, it's all about finding, being honest with yourself and seeing where your deficits are and thinking, okay, I've got to do something about it. So I'm thinking about the listeners here Mm -hmm. and there'll be some that are quite self-aware, but most of us, we don't know what we don't know. And as you don't know those deficits or Mm -hmm. you don't know the skills that you need that you're missing, how were you able to open your mind up to those possibilities? I I looked for help. First thing I do whenever I need help is go to the books. So I remember being on, I think it was podiatry arena one day and I saw a book by Tyson Franklin called There's No Doubt There's Money in Podiatry. And I looked at this and I read this book and I, I, I read it again, I read it again, I read it again. And it was a completely different thought process. It was business, which I've never done before. And so, I mean, I, I rang him and I spoke to him and, and we did a bit of mentor work together just to start with. And he's probably the first person that challenged me to step outside of my comfort zone and start in my own little practice. And so that's what led to me moving out of the little doctor's office and moving into a clinic room. And he started bringing up these things called advertising and marketing and these concepts that I really had no idea about, (laughs) which in hindsight is silly, but hey, you know, you don't know what you don't know. We'll start somewhere. And yeah, and and so that was the first step that taught me some of the things I didn't know. And it's, it's, it's like anything, you know, the further you go down the rabbit hole, the deeper it seems to get. And yeah. so it was like, okay, how do I do this? Okay, I've got to get a new skill. Okay, what do I do now? I've got to get a new skill. And I guess that's what led me to Clinic Mastery at the end of the day. It's just I was looking for something that can broaden me in as many ways as I possibly could mm-hmm. and help me take that step along my career as a podiatrist and a business owner. 
So we're going to touch on a bunch of those skills just mm-hmm. briefly, but, but can you paint a picture of now? So we sort of know where it started. What is life like now? You mentioned your family is really important. What's yep. your time like? What's your week like? What's the impact yep. of your clinic like in yep. your words? So my, my average week is I'm up at 4.30 in the morning. I get my first things done, which is my coffee. Try to do a bit of mindfulness training. I do a little bit of gratitude work as well, first thing in the morning. Mm-hmm. Then I'll hit the computer. I've got my day all time blocked. Mondays, I, I'm on the tools from about 8.30 to 7. Then I pick the kids up. Well, I pick my daughter up from ballet. Tuesday mornings, I'm on the tools again. And the rest of the day, I'm off the tools. Tuesday afternoon, I do mentor time with my team, my clinical team. Wednesday, I've got mentor time with the, my clinic mastery mentor. And a couple of other things that I do, Thursday is more mentor time for the team and our admin team. Fridays, I do a bit of work in an Aboriginal health centre in Port Lincoln every fortnight as well, just to try and, you know, give back a little bit. Nice. And then the weekends I try to keep for the kids, but usually if I'm out in the paddocks, then I'll have an audio book on and just try and be learning while I'm doing something else as well. So for me, structure has been really important and if I'm not getting things done, it's because I'm not following the structure. Uh, sure. And so I always come back to that all the time. If I feel unproductive or feel like I'm not having things or I'm not achieving things, yeah. That's awesome, mate, to get that time with your families uh, mm-hmm. and your team. You mentioned multi-site, multi-team. Yep. Now what uh, what sort of impact is your clinic having? It's pretty pretty darn good, really. I really enjoy the way we are at the moment. So we've got one clinic in Sterling, one in Blackwood. We've got admin staff at admin team at both of those, and we've got a couple of podiatrists at our Blackwood site and one at our Sterling site all the time, Monday through Saturday. And yeah, we do a lot of work together. We we really try to build our team as much as we possibly can. We have quarterly cuddles where we get together all day and just go through things. We have monthly CPD sessions for the podiatry team, but we also do CPD stuff for our admin team. I look at my clinic diary sometimes and, you know, the the finance part of me goes, oh my God, look at all that dead time where you're not seeing clients. But investing in your team is the most important thing you can do as a clinic owner. So so let me touch on that. I know Mm. we've worked hard at culture, especially in those early days and when teams smaller, has leadership always come easy to you and has building culture Mm. been a natural thing or describe that for us? I am a very much an introvert like yourself, Jack. I find being in front of people is exhausting. Mm. In fact, I'll probably have to have a nap after this because I'm... <laughs> Me too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> with a glass of, with a glass of Adelaide much. Hills yeah. red, hey? <laughs> oh, yeah, absolutely. But, you know, for me, leadership is about, once again, it's intent, equity and respect. I have to show show up for my team and I have to show my values all the time. And And if you have an awareness of your own values and you live those values and you demonstrate that to your team and you encourage them to follow their values as well, Mm. then I think that that is always going to be a way that you can build culture. Culture is not about a bunch of phrases on the wall. Culture is the way you show up. It's about leaning into difficult situations with your team and being aware of things that are going well for them, things that aren't going well for them and doing what needs to be done and doing the hard stuff as well. Doing the hard stuff is uh, it's easy to roll off the tongue. But yeah. what are some examples where you've done the hard stuff and it's paid off? Does any come to yeah. mind? Well, I know one of our podiatrists was really struggling with anxiety and he's been having a lot of issues and things. But leaning in and having difficult conversations and supporting him and giving him time off, he just loves where he's working, you know, and it's like he's – He's a graduate, but he can see now how much he's improved and he's starting to get a real confidence and he feels that this is the best place that he's ever worked. And he said that so many times. In fact, he gave me a little a little bobblehead of mm-hmm. he's in the background there, Obi-Wan Kenobi, yep. to say that thanks for being my Obi-Wan Kenobi. We're both wow. Star Wars nerds. So, you know, and it's little things like that, accepting people for who they are and supporting them through their troubles gives them a sense of stability. And I've had my own struggles with mental health in the past. So I know that unless you've got some stability somewhere, you can't move forwards and you can't get better, basically. So 
by giving your team that stability at work and that support at work, it means that no matter whatever life throws at them in their personal lives, they know that they've got support and stability at work. You know, people talk about a work-life balance, but I just think it's life. We shouldn't be thinking work versus life. We should be thinking just life and work is a huge part of life. Mm -hmm. So if you can support your team and keep them healthy and stable and looked after, then life's going to be a lot easier for them. That's awesome. And and as you take care of your team, they'll take care of your clients. That's right. Take care of the business. So, you you know, you mentioned as you're weak there, you spend a lot of time Mm -hmm. mentoring and and with your team. What else do you do to work on your business that Mm -hmm. is a really good use of your time? What's, Mm -hmm. What's been a great investment of your time? I think lately we've been focusing on things like building our website up, doing really good quality material on our website. We've been focusing on doing things which I find challenging, like contacting referrers. <laughs> I always think, oh, I don't want to bother doctors and I don't want to bother people. And As we but, all do. Uh, yeah, as we all do. But how do people know that you can help them unless they know that you can help them? So you have to share your skills. And I think it was Seth Godin that said you've got a marketing problem, the fact that If you've got the ability to help people, it's incumbent on us to share that with people so that they know how they can be helped. And that comes back to the educator within me. I want to change part of the thing that I want to see with with what we're doing at Complete Podiatry is to change the healthcare model to much more of an education-based model Mm. where we can give people the knowledge and the education to understand that your feet are central for everything that you do. You know, if you can't use your feet, you can't work, you can't look after your kids, you can't take care of family, you can't do all of these sorts of things. So how can we as podiatrists educate the wider community to see the importance of of feet? And so for me, that's starting to bring me around to thinking, well, it's my job to educate clients, but it's also my job to educate other healthcare professionals to see how important podiatry is and how important our role is in, in providing great outcomes for people from a health point of view. That's interesting, mate. You mentioned that, yeah, refer and nurturing. You, you touched mm-hmm. on a couple of skills that you've said haven't come naturally to you or you haven't yep. started. I'm interested how you go about learning. Like what's your ethos and what's your strategy for learning and growing as a clinic owner? Lots of reading. It, it's Audible is my best friend. I, I have so many books through Audible. Mm-hmm. Um, what's your, what's your listening speed, by the way? It's about 1.5 at the moment, but I'm working up to 1.75. So, yeah. yeah. Got a little sink in. Yeah, you do. You do. But if it's at 1.5, I can comfortably get quite a lot of that in, which is really good. Yeah. For me, though, I think it's talking to clinic owners, seeing that other people have done it. And, you know, it's like when Sarah and Hillary climbed Mount Everest, then there was a spate of other people that climbed Mount Everest because it was done. Right. Talked about that book earlier by Alex Hutchinson and Dewar. And he touched on this, the fact that when people think something is impossible, no one can do it, like the four-minute mile. Sure. But once you've reached that barrier and you've seen that other people can do it, then it comes easier for everybody afterwards. So, I mean, I've seen a lot of clinic owners who have shown a lot of amazing habits and a lot of skills to learn new skills that have broadened their practice, like yourself and, and Peter Flynn and all the other mentors that I've worked with at Clinic Mastery. And I guess talking with them has allowed me to say, oh, it can be done. And this is where they're at. This is where I'm at. There's a big gulf there. So obviously, I need to learn these skills. And I've had lots of help people pointing me in the right direction, the right books to read, uh, you know, podcasts to listen to like like this one. And and it just just grows, you know, And, and the more you know, the more you don't know. So you learn more. So you learn more. So you learn more. It, it's, it's this wonderful web. One of the things I love doing is putting connections together. You know, you can read a book here and a read a book there, but then the important thing is making those, those connections between all of these different things mm. and, and building that wealth of knowledge and that network of information and knowledge, I would say. I'm thinking about the lessons that listeners would be picking up as you're mm-hmm. speaking and, and that community and connection and yep. commitment to learning. What I've observed from you and your behavior is as you seek to learn and seek to lean into community and you, it's that giver's gain mentality, yeah, as yeah. You, you contribute. Yeah. You're always talking about the impact and clinics for good and those sorts of things. You're, you're sharing your learnings mm. and as a result, you're able to 
benefit from that. Mm. You, you've lent into mentoring, community and coaching mm. and all that stuff yep. incredibly well. So mm. what's the bigger picture? What are you currently working towards? Family or freedom, finance, giving? What is it for you at the moment? All of the above <laughs> in, in various degrees, I guess. Yeah, I, I guess I, I want to see my clinic still grow. I'd like to be able to help more people. And we have plans in place at the moment that we're looking at different options. I just like to see my team grow. The older I get, the more satisfied I get with watching other people do well. Why is that? I don't know. That's just who I am, I guess. Yeah, it's that whole nurturing aspect of myself. And I just love to see people do well. And I love to see my team do well. And the first person I hired, she's a single mum. She'd just gone to a really messy divorce. She was staying with her mum and dad and her life was really difficult and she didn't really have the, the skills I was looking for, but there was just something about her personality. I thought, well, yeah, I could see how people could connect with her. Right. During the last five or six years, we've worked together. She's now a practice manager and she does an amazing job. But now she's, she owns her own home. You know, she's doing really, really well. She's grown so much. And seeing that growth in her that I've been a part of just is the most amazing feeling in the world. And, you know, if you can touch one person's life to give them positives, that, that's huge. Mm -hmm. But as a clinic owner, you have the capacity to help not only your team, but this, this wider community as well. And, and what our, our core reason for being is to help build amazing lives from the feet up. And, and that's maybe about fixing someone's foot pain, but that's also about, teaching my team to grow as well and watching them grow and mm. you know i'm a podiatrist so i'm helping them grow and develop and become amazing people by having them within my business which is mm. kind of cool that's lovely but i don't know it just gives you goosebumps thinking about how many people you help it's, it's just yeah it's great that's, that's yeah absolutely goosebumps on arc and field singles yeah, um, yeah. Uh, if you if you're thinking about the the listeners maybe there is a clinic owner, early day mm -hmm. solo or small team, or there's yep. there's oftentimes the multi-site, you know, like you mentioned in your forties, kind of uh, been around for a while. Yep. What are some lessons or uh, or tips that you wish you'd done early, or things you're doing now mm -hmm. that you wish you had got a head start on? What advice have you got? Yeah, one of my favourite phrases I've learned from clinic master is to start with the end in mind. You know, what do you want? And that's a great question to ask. And I ask that of my team all the time what is it you want because if you know what you want then you can figure out how to get there and it's amazing in life how many people don't know what they want once again i bring this back to one of my core values of intent you know living life with intent having a purpose for what you're doing you know why do you get up in the morning because that's what you do it, it amazes me how many people just have this life that just goes through this i don't know this cycle of doing and doing and doing without stopping and thinking, what am I doing it for? So for me, starting with that end in mind is probably the most important thing. And then the next step is always planning how to get there. And, you know, you, you've got to make your goal so big and so important to you that no matter how many barriers are put, are put in front of you, you will still see that goal ahead of you. If your goal is to make an extra five bucks by the end of the week, you won't make it. It's not good enough. Oh, yeah. You need to have a real reason for it. And, and that reason is going to be different for everybody. But you need to have that goal of where you're going and then make a plan of how to get there. And I guess the, the third thing in that is you've got to do the work. <laughs> for a long time, I confused planning the work with doing the work. And right. I'd sit down Elaborate and plans. <laughs> yeah, abs oh, I tell you what, I'm I'm a big planner and I'd, I'd sit down and I'd do the work at the end of the day, I'd go, Oh, that was a great day. I've got so much done. But I'd done nothing. <laughs> I'd, I've got all these documents and spreadsheets and all this sort of stuff, but I haven't made a social media video or I haven't gone out to meet a referrer. Right. Or I haven't talked to the clinic owner next door. Uh -huh. Or I haven't walked down the road to say hello to the hairdressers that I've been meaning to do. And I, yeah, and then one day it hit me, oh, yeah, I'm confusing planning the work and doing the work. If you can avoid that, that's a good thing. 
<laughs> I love it, mate. You, uh, I, I really enjoy. I'm always energized by by time with you, and mm. uh, I'm sure clinic owners and listeners will have got so much out of our conversation today. Well, so, I hope so, yeah, I have no doubt. I have no doubt. Yep. If yep. people wanted to maybe check out your clinic or get in touch with you yep. personally, have a conversation, ask questions, how can they do that best? Our website is completepodiatry.com.au. Always building it and changing it, and, and I'm on LinkedIn, of course. Yeah, so they're probably my two best ways to connect. Yeah, happy we'll to make sure we chat. make sure we link all that up over on yep. uh, over on the show notes. So, listeners, cool. that's clinicmastery.com forward slash podcast. It'll be uh, completepodiatry.com.au or Anthony Robinson on the LinkedIn's. Mate, thank you so much for joining us. That has been fantastic, and uh, yeah, we're really honoured for your kind words about CM and, and just inspired by your journey as a clinic owner. Thank you very much, Jack. It's been an absolute pleasure. And listeners, thank you for joining us. As always, clinicmastery.com forward slash podcast for those show notes. Any reviews, ratings, you can do that on your podcast player of choice. And if you haven't already, make sure you take the Assess Your Clinic scorecard over on our website. Uh, That will give you insights as to how you're tracking and how you compare as a clinic owner in the seven degrees of growing your clinic. Thank you so much for joining us. We can't wait to bring you another episode of the podcast again really soon. Bye for now. Thanks for tuning in to the Grow Your Clinic podcast. To find out more about past episodes or how we can help you, head to www.clinicmastery.com forward slash podcast. And please remember to rate and review us on your podcast player of choice. See you on the next episode.